Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. Today I'm joined by Elise Zavala. Uh, interesting story. We met during Hacker Summer Camp uh, at Black Hat. And interesting thing was, like a lot of uh, encounters I have with some of my connections, is you end up meeting people that you're connected to on social media, but never met them before, don't really know them that well, just don't even, wouldn't even recognize them. So we kind of met and... It's really kind of cool hearing your story that not only were you, you know, working in offensive security, that you're also, you know, in a rock band, which is really kind of cool to hear some of these really interesting hobbies that people have. And I really, in my opinion, think that's very important to have these interests outside of cybersecurity, even though people can still put a lot of effort into cybersecurity. I think it's important to be able to disconnect for that for a bit, do something else. I think it's going to help with your longevity. And burnout, because one of the things I've kind of been trying to think of myself is trying to find hobbies myself, because I do lift and I'm in powerlift. I hadn't competed in a long time, but the more interest you have, the way you can just kind of get away from things, because sometimes when you're off and a lot of, I go to a lot of conferences and stuff, that's kind of what I do for fun. And then on the weekends, you find yourself bored, not knowing what to do. So, uh, so I think it's really great that you've got that interest and that other the other kind of uh, parallel career that you're running there. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. It's, it was really cool uh, getting to meet you. And fortunately, I was, uh, you know, we were walking across to to uh, the, the conference during Black Hat and overheard you speaking with someone else about, you know, working in offensive security. And so that kind of started the conversation. But uh, yeah, and mind, surprisingly... I asked you like, what, what's your handle? I'll follow you. And I was already following yeah. you. And then you asked me what my handle was and you were already following me. So it was perfect. It's, it's so funny how that, that happens. And, and one of the things too, that I do on, on Twitter too, is follow Fridays. You ever participate in the hashtag FF for follow Fridays? Oh, I see you yeah. posting that a lot. Yeah. Yes. One of the interesting facts, one of the interesting facts about that too, that I just recently found out about is one of my friends that works at bug crowd we were connected on Twitter or friends on Twitter before sure went to work for bug crowd. But interesting story was I included her on my follow Fridays and she ended up meeting her husband through my follow Fridays. How, it, how, does, how he, he's, he <laughs> saw her name in the follow Friday. So at the time, whenever they probably first met, I probably didn't know him yet, but the funny coincidence about it is that he was a, a former coworker of my wife's. So mm -hmm. they both kind of connected, trying to think of the timeline. I don't know if we, if he and I knew each other by then or what, but it was interesting. That's kind of how they met through the follow Friday. And she actually oh. shared that with me a while back. It's and really cute. They like, got married. He just started checking out all the profiles that you were, you know, putting in there. Yeah. And he was like, oh, she's yeah. pretty cute. Yeah, I guess it <laughs> oh, sli okay. slipped in, slipped in the DMs as they say, <laughs> I guess. Love it. Love but, it. But, but, but really cute. I got to meet, I'd. Uh, got to meet him like a couple years ago because I was in Chicago and my wife said, hey, if you want to have dinner with someone, uh, you should meet up with, uh, you know, this guy, my former coworker. I'm not real, real villain people's names. So we kind of met up, met for the first time. This is back in 2022. So we'd met. So I didn't get to meet her until like Bluff, DEF CON and Black Hat last year. So we had dinner together. So I got to meet, meet her as well. And so they got married, I believe, last year or earlier this year. And they're expecting their first child too. So it's really kind of cool. Love that. Especially when it's like people in cybersecurity getting together. I think that that's really cute. You know, there's a it lot of cool. couples in cybersecurity. <laughs> yeah, it's kind it. of good to be able to, it's kind of cool when you find someone with a similar interest like that. What, what else is kind of, yeah, but it was just kind of an interesting, interesting experience with, uh, with that. And just like I said, one of my favorite things is getting to meet people in person that you're connected online. And the funny thing about the online community is I don't know if you feel this way or not, but especially people you've interacted with and you kind of get to meet them for the first time. It seems like you've known them for a long time 
even though it might have been just virtual until you met him in person. Yeah, yeah. I think the only problem is is that like if they wrote their regular name on their tag, like I won't know who they are at all. But like luckily, some people actually put their handle on their tag. Like um, I, yes. I did like the second line of Bell Bites, you know, and so people came up to me and said, "Oh, I know Bell Bites," you know, on online. And so like if they put their their Twitter handle or X handle or whatever, uh, like then I'll recognize them. Otherwise, I I won't recognize. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. A few years back, actually before the pan- pandemic, there were some people that had really good ideas. They would go get these little badges made with their Twitter handle on it. So Love that it. way when they'd be out, people would be able to, to be able to find them, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so so before we get too far into the conversation, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing your, your hacker origin story, kind of how you started out up until the point where you're at today in your career. Ah, okay. Um, well, I think, um, like, so one of my very early, um, I started out in IT. Um, I was on the geek squad for like seven years. I did advanced repair agent. I was in the back, so I didn't have to work with customers. And, um, I think I started, um, specializing, I guess, in like a lot of the malware that people couldn't remove. So they kind of made me like get into, whenever other ARAs couldn't remove um, malware all the way and like if customers came back and let's say they wiped the computer and it's completely new OS or whatever and they were just like, it's still slow. I think it's still infected. Um, like I got really into like brew kits and boot kit like research and stuff like that. And I don't know, I just got really passionate about like advanced malware extraction. Um, and then I switched over to um, cyber defense. I got into defense over at Duke University. And um, at Duke, I was in charge of the intrusion prevention system. And um, with that, I we had to write snort rules, you know, to um, detect malicious traffic that's not already in the uh, Cisco firepower or whatever. And so um, I had to read a lot of blogs of like newer techniques. New, like I got really into like cyber defense evasion so that way I could try the techniques in these blogs and then be like, oh, well, yeah, the IPS did not catch it. And then I had to write the snort rules and everything like that in order to catch it. And I think um, getting into uh, that, I was just having more fun with the hacker um, blogs, like the, the actual hacking techniques than I was in the defense, like aftermath. Um, so Duke University is very... Um, huge in like uh pushing like academia uh, like just academic research and stuff like that and so they really want people to just learn um like we did a lot of um like lock picking villages and and cross trainings and stuff like that with the students and with the teachers and stuff like that and um in other departments and so i think they just they bought sans vouchers by the bulk um and so you know sans they're very expensive um, yes. And so uh, Duke University would just buy bulk, like massive amounts. And so they had to be used within the calendar year. And so I was like super excited to get into offense. So I was just like, let me take them. I'm going to take them all. Oh, you're not going <laughs> to use them? Sure. And so I think I was taking like three sands sir, like per year. It was just like insane. Um, and yeah, I just, I really was passionate about like, the hacking side and so even though um so duke university has like a information security office for like the medical side and then they have an it security office for the um academic side and so i worked on the academic side and there was no pen testing there's no penetration testers at that time and so um since i was getting like my gpan and my uh, gxpn for like you know exploit research and stuff i i and i got really really big into ctf um competitions and stuff like that as well back then um so i think it was just naturally like i was just getting antsy and wanting to do something like for duke and so i had conversations with like um the now uh cso uh nick trip he's um but the older cso was richard beaver so i nick and i sat with richard beaver and we convinced him to let us like start pen testing for duke and so now Richard is, uh, sorry, now Richard retired and Nick is actually now the CISO of Duke, which was amazing because he and I started the pen testing program at, at uh, Duke University, essentially. 
um but uh yeah it was it was great i got to like track like the chiller plant and i got exposed to i mean i got i um started hacking like a lot of the web applications and stuff like that for the various areas of the school and then um I got into physical security assessments where we had to like break into like various warehouses where Duke was housing their um, like their student uh, records and things like that. And so I thought that that was really fun. I got to start doing like lock picking and um, trying to break into buildings, you know. And so um, before I knew it, yeah, I, I was getting. Um, I think with all once I, I mean, I just had a lot of packing certs by then, and I was hacking a lot of stuff for Duke that um, I started getting um job offers i guess um in certain places and um options clearing corporation um i basically uh, stumbled across an opportunity um where they wanted me to hack for them which was great so i got to um options clearing corporation does like stocks and options and futures um there's actually only seven companies in the entire world called a SIFMO. It's a significantly important financial market utility where like if the network goes down for like over 30 minutes, like it could dramatically impact world markets. And like if the network goes down for like two hours or something, it could like the United States financial stability could tank and world markets could tank. Oh, wow. It's just really, <laughs> you know, no pressure, right? <laughs> Having had them, you know. Um but yeah, so I, I had the amazing opportunity to help. Um, yeah, I was hired as a senior penetration tester on the red team. And um, then I started growing out the team. And I became a lead penetration tester. And then I became a uh, um, technical manager. When my, my manager, he had some issue with uh, family. He had to leave very suddenly. And um, they needed someone to run the team. And I was already running the team. And so they just kind of asked if I wanted to go management, but I, I was so passionate about being technical um, that I didn't want to go management. And so they convinced mm -hmm. me um, that I can maybe wear both hats, you know, and I could still hack in the trenches with my team and they would provide me the R&D time, uh, the research and development time to still be able to do exploit research and stuff uh, and kind of shield me from some of the other um, management type uh, meetings. So because our red team is um, a completely separate chain of command as the defense team anyway. So it was kind of easier to just keep me separated. And so I, that way I can still hack with my team, but I can also do time cards you know, and build them up. And um, be, after that, yeah, I just kept building the team. We got bigger and bigger. And now I'm executive director of the security red team at OCC. Very cool. Yeah, I really like your career path. That's really interesting. And that's really a good example for anyone listening that even if you're middle of your career beginning or trying to break in, that you took advantage of opportunities you had because, you know, you can look at it whatever way you want. And it's not a matter of anyone can say you got lucky. You were at this, you know, at Duke, you had access to all this training you could take. You took it upon yourself to take the training, to learn the skills. And then you asked if you could do pen testing within that, university so you opened up opportunity they may have not been there so these are good lessons for anyone that's listening is you know it doesn't hurt to ask i mean you can at least ask and and just <laughs> when people show the desire and want to do those things the passion people you know really like that so yeah yeah i think they they saw my enthusiasm to learn and like i was i was doing really well on resorts and everything like that and i did and i was doing well in uh cts competitions and stuff like that um i don't know i I don't know. I just got, I just convinced them. I said, I can work on hacking before work and after work it can be like an extracurricular thing. You don't have to pay me extra. Just like, let me hack. And they were like, no, we'll let you uh, pivot. So it was really nice. <laughs> That's very cool. So, you know, based on, you know, obviously what you did worked, but if you were going to give advice to someone that just wanted, that was just starting out wanting to become a pen tester, what would you recommend education wise? Mm, okay. Um, people may disagree with me on this one. Um, but I think personally, um, my, my degree was in biology with a focus in genetics. Okay. So I don't even use my degree. Um, I think it's nice to have a piece of paper for some companies, you know, who would require a piece of paper, but a lot of people in our field, like have philosophy degrees and like, you know, art degree, degrees that aren't even in hacking, you know? 
So I think um, personally, um, when I'm ha- when I'm hiring people, even um, I'm less concerned about whether they have a bachelor's degree. I'm actually more concerned about their hands-on hacking capabilities. Um, so there's like um, certain cert- certifications that I find, in my opinion, to be more so definition and theory based. And I don't put a lot of weight. Like um, if I see the CEH on someone's resume, I'm probably going to ask you still a lot of scenario based questions. So that way it's not like I'm not asking you definition questions and stuff. I want to know what you would do with your hands on on a box and you, you need to do some privilege escalation. If you need a lateral, you need, what are you going to do next? You know, and I think scenario based questions helps me like, understand your mindset and like choose your own adventure kind of thing and we can like kind of go down the rabbit hole together um i think that um the ceh might prepare people for theory um or definitions but i i've I've noticed that people that i've interviewed with those certifications don't really have a lot of hands-on hacking experience um whereas people who have like the oscp osce any of the oswe a lot of the offensive security certifications you know those exams are like hands-on you had to actually hack during the exam to get the cert and i think that that's really cool uh it's important and i think that those people tend to do much better for um not only hands-on uh, experience already ready to ready to rock and roll um but they have a lot of the attitude that i need for you know try harder the exploits aren't going to already work just straight from exploitdb.com or you know it's not automatically going to work you're going to have different security controls and different um, you know, some people might custom build some obscure parsing mechanism on the back end of doing some weird stuff. And so, like, it's never going to you're going to hit those blockers. And I need people who are going to try to get around these blockers and, and think weird. I like people who think weird. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I think if you're starting in, in my opinion, I think it would be beneficial for you to start off with like cap like down. Um, hack the box um i haven't tried try hack me but i've heard you know some people in our industry have but i did a lot of hack the box um and there's a there's a lot of youtube uh videos um a lot of researchers will actually walk you through the box like beginner boxes and things like that there's a lot of blogs as well um like john hammond is really good when he first started and with his channel he had a lot of um like here is the CTF and here's my mindset of trying to tackle the CTF. And he would like not cut out when he, when something didn't work, like he would go down a full path and be like, well, that didn't work. All right. Back to square one guys, (laughs) you know? And I think that that was good because anybody who watches him is going to see our job involves failing, failing and failing and failing and then failing more, (laughs) you know, and (laughs) you you have to kind of get used to that and, and embrace you know and learn as you go um and see it as like well i learned a lot you know even if it didn't end up in you know somewhere f- fruitful you were able to get around these security controls or learn along the way so i would tell them to start off with half the box um and then i would tell them uh to maybe oh i mean unless they have like zero um like network knowledge like maybe they should do some sort of like networking 101 you know, kind of uh, stuff on like LinkedIn learning or, or some of the, the free trainings online or things like that. They don't necessarily have to do a full cybersecurity bachelor's degree. I mean, they, they can if they want, but I think that if you're trying to get in, get in a position quickly, I think it would be good for you to get like some networking 101 experience, get some like web application 101 experience, building your own web application, o- opening up those web server ports, that sort of thing, understanding, you know, um, the traffic, even of like a simple, like Python HTTP server, you know, like how, do, how does this work, you know? Um, and then like, if, I don't know, I think, um, yeah, get some, like maybe some Python or, or some kind of network, uh, some type of uh, programming language. Um, uh, 101 course, maybe a Linux 101 course, Windows command, you know, 101, um, just like basics. And then I think they should start off with like the hack the box, beginner boxes and grow from there. And then from that, once they're ready, I think they should get into like offensive security certifications, um, 
or like the CT, uh, the CRTO. I've heard good things about the Red Team Operator certification. I took SANS courses, but I know not a lot of people can have the budget for an eight thousand dollar course. Um, but I think there is um, some um, good things about SANS where they they show like a lot of the foundational knowledge already. So like they they will kind of give you some of that one-on-one knowledge as you're learning before, you know, to understand what this tool is doing and stuff. So if, if you need a little bit more hand-holding, SANS is great. Um, but like, yeah, offensive security certs, they're so hard that I think you'll be like ready to rock and roll and get hired if you have those certs. I think they'll just be beneficial for you to put yourself through that um, uh, torture. <laughs> so for, for so for someone who's trying to make that next step that maybe they're working in offensive security, what are your recommendations for someone that wanted to move into exploit development? Um, okay. Um, so it depends on what they really, I, I guess, what they're passionate about, but because people have different silos of interest. Um, in my opinion, I found it very helpful for me to go to like exploitdb.com and I was actually downloading like the vulnerable apps. Like you can download the apps itself and then don't look at the exploit DB code. Like don't look at the answers. Right. And then you try to like use like American fuzzy lap and things like that. Try to crash it yourself. Try to like, um, you know, debug the, the, um, application and everything like that and try to find the buffer overflow, try to find those, uh, like remote code execution vulnerabilities and stuff yourself and then check your answer to the answer that's online and see how your code is different from theirs. And maybe you found the same bug, maybe you found a different bug, but I always thought that was kind of fun when I was learning. Um, and then I think time is essential um when it comes to like just finding any kind of new zero days so um even if you're not going to get into like reverse engineering per se i think it might be uh as a with occ we we have an internal red team so one thing i noticed is that like with consulting teams you got a week get in there get out you know like get in there get as fast as you can straight to domain admin ring the bell and then get out and so a lot of consulting teams get really good at active directory attacks but they don't know as much about like enumerating like a custom like web app or with rest apis and things like that or they they might do less with like um developing exploits for maps and, and things like that you know and so i think that um the thankful thing that i i've been able to um experience with occ is that since i run the team i get to control how long we put into a project so um if we're testing um you know some brand new appliances uh that maybe a vendor has given us you know not only can we assess how hardened they've created that uh server uh is there any kind of docker container escapes and things like that um that might be fruitful for our engagement um i, I don't know i think that um we have stumbled across even though we're testing OCC's implementation of, you know, the, the infrastructure there, I think we've, since we've had so much time to like, if I'm testing a, if, uh, a printer, if I'm testing all the printers at OCC, right. If I'm testing it for a month, I might find some zero days with Xerox or, or dope printers or whatever the printer is. Right. And so then you have to have like a responsible disclosure process in order to actually disclose those bugs later. Um, but it, I mean, yeah, I guess it depends on what they're passionate about. If they're really excited about web apps then, um, or, you know, or, um, network based attacks or whatever, I think there's potential to find zero days in whatever your silo of interest is. If you put the, enough time and effort into it. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Since you mentioned zero days as a high manager, how, how well, or how much do you value CVEs, if someone comes in with CVEs on the resume, how does that kind of weigh on your opinion compared to someone with maybe just certifications? Huge, huge. I actually um, told my, so I had, I recently had two um, job openings um, on, on my red team and um, I told the recruiting uh, people uh, into a meeting with my HR people person and I said, 
disregard whether they have uh, a bachelor's degree. Just completely disregard that. I don't care. Um, I'm really focused on um, if they have like offensive security certs, that's great. That'll give some extra points. And then if they have um, like anything involving like CVEs, like bugs that they have found, um, if they if they've done like Hacker One and, and Bug Crowd and, and things like that for like um, finding their own zero days, I I, w- I want to look at those resumes. I prioritize those resumes. I'm not saying that I'm not going to look at the other resumes. You know, if you've done your time, you know, doing cybersecurity, bachelor's degree, and you have all these certifications and 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 SAN certs. Even you know, I'll look at SAN certs. I gave a whole list of certs um, that I think would be um, prioritized. Um, but I'll look at the other people. I just tend to think that the people with CVEs already um, might be good at um, my scenario-based questions. Because um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to just ask like, "Hey, what's the difference between cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery?" <laughs> like, I don't want, I don't want you to Google your answer while we're talking. I'd rather like us uh-huh. just like, I'd rather us just like, "Hey." let's i'm gonna give you i'm gonna put you in a like linux terminal you know how do you find out like what privileges you have right now and how would you try to break out of those privileges and and escalate you know or in just like various scenario based questions you know and i'll find that some people that are really siloed in like web applications these days a lot of times they solely rely on like burp pro scans results and that's it they just send the results straight to the um the client or they send the results straight to the um it owner and when the it owner tries to ask them can you explain this java deserialization vulnerability or can you explain any of these things they either a don't really know how to explain in depth or they don't really know how to explain how to fix it in depth um like and a lot of them have you know explained to me that they don't even know how to get an actual web share like they don't ever go the extra mile to actually perform the exploit and get on the box and then move from there. Um, so I think it's important to me that I, I don't want just somebody who only has scanning experience, um, you know, or theory experience to just send it to an IT person and be like, ah, I think it's vulnerable. It says, the scan says it's vulnerable. I think it's important mm-hmm. for them to understand how to actually perform the exploit and then what wasn't found in the scans, you know, and and maybe how you can possibly know why it wasn't found in the scans and so that you can um, just manually perform testing, which is important, especially for red teams that need to be covert anyway. If you're being stealthy, if you, you need to know how, how to manually uh, do things with your hands and, not with, and with your own custom code instead of relying on tools. So. Yeah, one of the things I've kind of think with tools is really... I think it's really affected how people are you are doing coding because you think of some of the things that you can do with Burp Suite, some of the other tools. Because, you know, before when you you before people were using like Burp Suite, and you have to use something like Hydra to brute force. You'd have to put like the URL path, the login path, and all this stuff in to set it up, and it was just easier easier to use something like Burp Suite or Zap or something else. So it's really interesting. It seems, I, in my opinion, I think some of the tools and then even like a Metasploit has made it easier for people to use these tools and not really focus on, on learning how to code and do things manually. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But I think the issue with that is, is that those pen testers are pretty much only going to test in a white box, like non-stealth engagement, you know, because they're going to be, they're going to be running and map aggressive scans or they're going to be running, you know, just like they're going to crawl in an aggressive way. And it's, it's going to get caught by the defense team. Defense team is going to see them. Um, they're going to see you when you put like a pre-compiled version of Rubius onto a, a box. They're, 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 it's going to get caught. Um, and so I think knowing um, what those tools are doing manually um, might allow you to be able to be a little bit more covert if you need to do a red team engagement and simulate a more sophisticated adversary. Very cool. So, uh, you know, don't want to disappoint the, the the viewers and want to go ahead and kind of get into, you know, kind of your your other career as a rock star, a vocalist for for a uh, a band. So oh, I think man. that's pretty interesting because it's always cool to to find out what you know things people are doing outside the day job or the interest. And 
So it was really interesting to find out that you were a vocalist in a band. So if you wouldn't mind sharing about your band and that experience. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, I've always been in like bands and singing competitions growing up, but I think um, when I moved back um, to North Carolina, um, I decided to just start a new, uh, I ended up having a breakup and I had all this extra time on my hands outside of working <laughs> and only writing exploits, right? Uh, so I decided to start another rock band. And um, this time, instead of me being the only singer, I've I've always loved Linkin Park growing up. So I really mm -hmm. liked the um, rap, uh, rap and rock uh, dynamic of Linkin Park with uh, Chester. Now, now I know that they have a female singer, but back in the day, mm -hmm. they didn't. Either it was a male rapper yes. and female, uh, sorry, it was a male rapper and male singer. And so I thought, well, it would be really cool. And this was back in 2020, okay? I thought it would be really cool to start a rock band where we have a male rapper and a female singer. Um, so I did it first, guys. Don't assume I'm going to do it. But anyway, yeah. So I, uh, I auditioned a bunch of people. Um, I went on Craigslist and Facebook and Bandmix and everything. And um, I made posts, you know, looking for rappers. And like when I saw their profile, it was just like money. You know, it would uh, skip a lot of those people. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I auditioned all the members. And um, I kind of started it like, kind of like a CEO would start a business. Like I, I didn't, I've been in a lot of bands growing up where like we just kind of like hung out and jammed a little bit and like it didn't really go anywhere. And when you have a lot of people steering the ship, the ship doesn't really get to the destination because you're all compromising, you know, a meeting in the middle and stuff like that. So I thought that if I started this, um, this band, which is Lilac, by the way, it's spelled, it's spelled a little bit. So it's L Y L V C. So it's a V instead of an A. It's upside down A. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, Lila, L Y L V C. Um, so I started this band and I thought that I would kind of be the only one steering the ship, you know? So um, the, all of us, you know, we write music together and stuff like that. And we were quarantined together. We wrote a bunch of songs. Um, but yeah, we were just kind of more, I guess I was more driven with, okay, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. And so we recorded um, with Howard Benson, uh, uh, Howard Benson's uh, studio with Mike Plotnikoff and Joe Ricard. And um, they've recorded like Hailstorm, Three Days Grace, Seether, um, Flyleaf, like just Bon Jovi, Kelly Clarkson. Like they've just recorded so many people. Uh, and so that's who recorded our first EP. So go big or go home, okay? Don't don't start <laughs> low, you know. Like just like go, as you can tell with like even exploit research, I'm like go straight for half the box, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so I don't know. I think I just have that mindset for like this way possible. So with um with band, yeah, I, I was just like okay, let's record with them, and then we did our music video um for Perfect Drug and it blew up. It got like over a million views um, and it was wow. crazy. And then um, Rob McDermott, who used to manage Lincoln Park, he wanted to work with us. And then uh, Tony Couch, who manages In This Moment and I See Stars and Eva Under Fire, he wanted to work with us. And uh, so we, we ended up going with Tony. Rob McDermott is great. I love him. So if, you're, if he ends up watching this, I love you. Uh, and, but yeah, we <laughs> just ended up going with uh, C3 um, with Tony Couch. And then, um, yeah, before I knew it, I had like PR reps that worked for me and Radio Promo reps. And um, yeah, we released a couple more songs. Um, the new music, so we have unreleased music right now that we're sitting on. We recorded with Cam Sharko, who was recorded uh, hits for like Five Finger Death Punch and Disturbed and Ozzy and just a whole bunch of um, amazing bands. And um, anyway, we just recorded a whole bunch of music with him. And um, the music video, uh, we so there's this guy named Jensen Nolan who's blowing up right now. But his music videos are insane. They're like an Avengers movie, okay? But if you look up, if any of you want to, like, see some crazy graphics for a three-minute video, like, look up Falling in Reverse, like, uh, the Ronald video. And it, like, seriously, like, he, there's, like, this giant devil and, like, he gets sucked into the ground and there's, like, this huge tornado thing around him in Tech 9. It, it's just, like, the craziest visual effect ever. 
for a three minute music video. It, it's seriously like a movie. Okay. And um, so I thought that with um, we have a new song called Barely Human. And uh, I thought since I like creating viruses, <laughs> I make a lot of malware for my work. <laughs> I thought, what if there was this, and, and also my job, my uh, bachelor's degree was in, you know, biology with a focus in genetics. I really like genetics too. So I thought like, what if there's like this fictional story of like where I created a virus and it infected human DNA somehow. And maybe most of the humans died, but of the few remaining human survivors, maybe like their genetic code interacted with machine code better. I don't know. It's very fictional. So you, you, we know this, but it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's still, it's just a fictional story. And so anyway, I thought, um, okay, well, if there's the last remaining hum- human survivors are like fighting in this post-apocalyptic world and, you know, everybody is dead and it's broken into, you know, like it's, uh, they're just turf warring, you know? And so some people are just like, let's go full AI. Let's just go full robot guys. Come on. You know? And like the other people are like, no, let's hold on to empathy and let's hold on to, you know, fighting for like a human you know humanity and you know regaining our humanity and the, but like as we're fighting you're getting an arm blown off and you're replacing it with a robotic arm you lose it and you replace it with a robotic eye and so who better to hire for that kind of crazy vision than jensen nolan i thought that the visual effects are going to be insane and so um we just did a music video shoot with him and uh right now uh they're going to take six weeks uh, to put all of the visuals on there because we we had this like crazy katana fight scene and everything. I mean, it's it was insane. Like I had like thirteen female extras and I had like ten male extras, including you know Robert Downey Jr. Right, Iron Man. Mm-hmm. So yes. um, Robert's son Indio, he and I became friends, and I asked Indio to join my video. So Indio is actually in my music video too. So I got I don't have oh. Iron Man, but I got Iron Man's son. That's very cool in my music video. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so um, the visual effects should be done in six weeks. Um, but all the music industry stuff shuts down uh, for Thanksgiving through mid January. So we're not going to be, we're probably looking at a early, um, like at end of January or early February release now. So it postponed our fall tour and stuff, but I think it's going to be really, really worth it. So I'm excited. Oh, that's very cool. So who are some of the different bands you've toured with? Um, yeah, so we've toured with like Atreyu and Pop Evil oh, and cool. Game on Fire. Um, yeah, our New Year's Day, a bunch of bands. I, I, so the first tour we did was a West Coast to like mid-U.S. tour. And then uh, the second uh, tour was like more more West Coast, like all the way up and then over to like Midwest. And then the third tour we did was um, just East Coast and Midwest. Uh, in Midwest. So um, I'm excited to figure out. Uh, I know that there's a festival in February. That's like a big, uh, I think last year they had Bush and Dorothy and like a lot of bands. There was a whole bunch of bands uh, on that festival. Well, we're on that festival in February. And then they're doing like a two week tour, apparently right after the festival with those festival bands. So apparently it's just a lot of big huge bands going on the road together and so uh if we release barely human at the end of january we'll be releasing it with that february tour so i'm really excited that's very cool so how is that managing that career along with your your day job how's that how's that is that very hard to manage or? Uh, no i mean so far so good um i mean like the good thing is is that um you know, as a hacker, you know, we can bring our laptops anywhere. So as long as it, I work remotely, I mean, I know some people are required to go into the office, um, but my team uh, works remotely full, full time. Uh, and so I just basically hired a driver. Um, my The driver that I hired, uh, he, he's driven like Slayer and Deftones and just a bunch of bands. Um, so I, I let him drive. Uh, we have our private bunk beds in the back. And so he would drive to the next city, like, and we'd end up at a, a gym uh, where we're all members of. We would go in there, shower, come in back to the bus, and we would all work our day jobs because all of us work remotely. So we'd work our day jobs remotely, and then we'll be ready to sound check by, you know, five. I mean, work would be done already, you know, by mm-hmm. the time sound check started. So it was, um, I didn't have to take any PTO my past couple tours. Like, I took zero days off. I just 
worked my day job and then I sang at night and worked my day job and sang at night, you know, and it, it ended up being okay. And touring, it's like, you know, you have like, you have like a month long tour and then you're back home for like two to three months. So you're, I mean, I get, then I can just focus only on hacking. So it, it's worked out. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's fun. So do you, do you kind of think that helps you with burnout in your job, having this other interest that you're not all 100% into one thing? Mm, um, I think that I'm, I think me personally, I still get burnout because I think I put on a lot, I put a lot of responsibilities on myself. I just recently started like, I think delegating more. Um, but like, I think I, I've just always been so, um, particular about like, oh, you have problems, pile it onto me. Oh, you have these problems, pile it onto me. That's fine. Oh, you're having these, these stressors or whatever. And so I think that I prioritize my team to have extreme work-life balance. Like I want them to have, you know, cause they have their babies. I don't have any kids or I don't have family or anything. So like, I just, I see them having these beautiful families with their kids and things like that. And so I tend to put a lot of the extra workload on myself. And so I think that, um, I'll, even after a show, I was still like logging back in, finishing a couple pen test reports, sending it out in the middle of the night, you know, at 2 a.m. And then I was, you know, going back to my bunk, uh, and trying to sleep so I can sing the next day. Um, but I think that, um, for the next tour, I should have uh, a little bit more work-life balance. I'm working on traveling as, as you and I spoke earlier. Like I'm working on traveling, actually taking PTO and, and trying to meditate and trying to like find that work-life balance. That's good. Yeah. I was going to, to ask after that, what are your, some of your advice for work-life balance and, mm -hmm. and avoiding burnout? And I know you mentioned meditation. Does that seem to really be making a difference? Uh, I think so. I, I, so when I first started meditating uh, in January, I found myself falling asleep <laughs> almost <laughs> every single time, uh, which I don't think that that's, I mean, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> but um, I, like I, I would just go on YouTube and I would just type in guided meditations, you know, for like a 10 minute meditation or a 20 minute meditation, because I feel like I'm constantly thinking of like, all of my to-do lists, all of the, you know, the, the different code problems that my team is having, the different code problems I'm having or the research that I need to do individual as an individual researcher as well. And so I think I'm just, my brain is constant all day and we're constantly looking at a computer. And so it's very important for us to just like close our eyes, listen to a guided meditation and, and use a a different sensory, like, uh, you know, thing that, you know, then pulling my eyes in my hands, you know, I, I like hearing it and closing my eyes, I think was helping me, but I was falling asleep so quick. Like <laughs> I was just exhausted. <laughs> um, but I think I, yeah. Um, I don't know, a couple months ago I, I started getting, I, I just stopped falling asleep in the middle of the meditations. Like most of the time I can actually do the full 10 to 20 minute meditation now. And, um, yeah, I think it, it's been really helpful because after I'm done with it, I feel a lot more calm and I feel more clear headed. And maybe there were some um, things that I might have been beating my head against the wall and, and just rabbit holing for like a certain exploit. And I found that um, after I meditated for, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, I I immediately thought of a way around that blocker. And so it's been helpful for me. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I've heard some other folks doing it that that's really helped with stress and stuff. So uh, always something I've been kind of curious about myself. You should let me know if you fall asleep. <laughs> I probably would. I know it's not the same thing, but one of the things I was experienced with is I used to use go to a hypnotist, especially back in my powerlifting competition did that work? days. It did work. And it was kind of crazy motivation wise. I remember going in for a session one day and I, I was training with a powerlifting team and I went in one day and normally I'm, I perform really good at, in competitions, but I'm not always, you know, performing, you know, top way, top, you know, within the gym, you know, in training sessions wasn't mm -hmm. always the best, but competitions I do well. After that session, I got into the gym and it was crazy because my 
teammates asked me what got into you because I had such a good workout. Wow. And one of the things he did too, is he gave me some cues to help me sleep. So one of the cues is like tap on your thigh three times and you'll be able to sleep. So he gave me some cues to help with sleeping, but I was really amazed how well the, the, the hypnosis worked. It really helped a lot. But one of the things about it too, is relaxation wise, when you're getting hypnotized, you about fall asleep during that. And once you kind of come out of it, it's like a really relaxing feeling. Wow, that's amazing. It was the effects only one day, though, or like, did do you find that it actually lasted some time? I think you just had to keep up the sessions for it to work because they'd give you different cues for different things, uh, things to think about, things, motions to do when you're in the gym, getting ready to lift or whatever. You know, like if you're getting ready to lift, there were certain cues that he would give me, and it seemed like as long as you were following up with those things, it worked well. And then I saw. I'd some people that did it, you know, really put a lot of emphasis in it in powerlifting. They would go to whoever did the hypnotherapy. They'd get like a CD of the session and listen to those when they weren't uh, going to the live sessions. Interesting. I I recently got into um like like sleep uh, meditation. Like while you're sleeping, it'll it'll say things um to like help you. I guess reprogram like. Yeah, I don't know, even like whether it's like old stress or old trauma or anything like that. It, like it, it kind of gets into like um, affirmations and things like that, like while you're sleeping and you wake up like super positive about your day. And um, even though you were just sleeping, um, but I know that um, I start, there's also people who do that for like informational things as well, like learning. Because um, yeah. when I, I know that if I had to learn all the lyrics to a song and I only had one day. I would listen to it in the headphones the entire night and I'll wake up in the morning and I'll listen to the song one time. And I knew all of the words, like, I don't yeah. know. So like just having it on repeat, you know, you like learn it, I guess, in your sleep. Um, so I, I think it would be cool to like, listen to some like really technical, like super technical breakdowns of uh, <laughs> certain uh, things that would be, you know, cybersecurity related. And I wonder how much we can actually ingest. <laughs> If we're just yeah, listening be... to the audiobooks in our sleep. Mm -hmm. That would be curious to see because I've, I've heard of people doing that for learning, you know, taking college courses because my wife, uh, she would originally start out like in the medical field, medical side of things. She was an occupational therapist and there are different things that they needed to learn for their classes. And she used to just have it on a cassette tape and listen to it. And I've talked to people that need to really go back and ask her how well she thought that worked because, you know, if you could sit there and do this learning while you're sleeping, if you could actually get anything out of it, that would be pretty nice. That'd be crazy. I think it needs to be repetitive though. So I don't know yeah. if you can go like a full eight hours, you know, of, of you know, completely different material. I think it's going to have to be like one section that you really want to learn in a repeated way. But I mean, I could be wrong, <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Very cool. So we're getting down towards the end of the episode. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close it up? Um, well, I, uh, I, Stephen Sims reached out to me and asked if I wanted to speak at Hollywood Hackfest on October. Uh, I think Hollywood Hackfest is October 28th and 29th. So I'm going to be uh, performing a talk on the 29th, which is cool. I don't know if they've announced it yet, but if you guys come to Hollywood Hackfest, please come to my talk and let me know whether you like it or not. It's going to be um, on um, using AI to help you develop uh, payloads for browser-based exploits and um, like web application exploits and defensive, like defense evasion uh, type payloads and strategies um, to not get caught by EDR, uh, modern EDR systems. Uh, so hopefully you like that. Um, and then um, I also, if you want to listen to my music, uh, go to lilac.com. It's L Y L B C, or you can go to like uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, everywhere, and just type in um, L Y L B C, and uh, you'll be able to see when we release our new music video, Barely Human. I'm gonna have, you know, I'm gonna be barely human. I'm gonna have half robotic parts, half <laughs> human parts. It's, it should be an amazing music video. I'm really excited. We'll be releasing that at the beginning of the year. Oh, very cool. Even though it's, you mentioning that I recently released the episode today, but Lynn, no, he is considered the first augmented ethical hacker. So he's got 
chip implants and all this stuff it built I into himself. That. So <laughs> I love that so much. I well, I don't yeah. want to like completely play into the like I don't want to be that for like stage performances. I know that some people can be very gimmicky, uh, like where they just go, you know, full robot costume and stuff like that. I don't want to do that. Uh, yeah. But I do think that it's fun to do it for, you know, one music video, just be like this, like, badass, like, yeah, you cool. know, half robot thing. Um, but yeah. yeah, a lot of my other music videos, they kind of vary based off of what I wrote the song about. So if you are interested in watching any of my music videos, just go to YouTube. And... Oh, cool. I have to check that out. Yeah, let so, me know what you think. Yeah. They're my older music videos, but uh, I think the new music is, like, completely insane. So it's like a next uh, level. That's cool. So. Yeah, Excited very cool. See. Well, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's great to get to know you more. Yeah, same. Likewise, this one, like I mentioned, my favorite thing is meeting my connections in person and getting to know more about them. So it's really cool. And I think whenever you, whenever I found out that you're a rock singer, then I thought, yeah, this is a story people need to hear. So it would be, I think people would be very interested and in not to mention, you know, a badass hacker too. So. <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah, it's it's been great. Like they, can, I I would love to see if we can do like I know like I think Laughing Mantis does a, has a band, and I think uh, Stevenson Steven Sims has a band. I, I mean, a bunch of our hacker community does music. I wonder if there's ever like a conference where we can just like have our bands play. I don't know. I think that, that would be, be very cool. cool. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> I and mean, there's probably probably enough people to 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 do a concert. I would I would think because you know you have. You mentioned Stephen Sims yourself and, uh, and some other folks, even Dual Core from the community oh, that yeah. does a lot of the, the rap type yeah. stuff. Hack all the things, yeah. drink all the booze, yeah. hack all the things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That yeah. would be really cool. That would be okay. cool. Okay. Well, yeah. it, was great to, it was great to meet you and I'm glad I got yeah. to join. Same. Great chatting with you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.